All right. Good to see all of you staying around this morning and sharing our Bible study time. If you happen to check back in with us online, thank you for being here for our Bible study. Uh, for about the next 30 minutes, uh, we'll be talking about the, the joy of Christian fellowship. And this is lesson eight in our series. I've had some folks who have asked for copies of uh, slide outlines, uh, either uh, by email or printed copy. If I can oblige anybody with that, let me know. Or all the lessons are archived online. You're able to click back into them at your leisure if you miss one and, uh, and get uh, a catch up with what it is that you might have missed. Last week, we talked about the biblical mandate for unity. The Bible calls for us to be the family of God, His people, and calls for us to have a, a unity, a oneness about us. When we talk about fellowship, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about our partnership, our, our commonality, what it is that connects us together so that even though we're sitting in an auditorium or, we, or the, the constituent members of a congregation that we're not isolated entities, but we're connected entities. And this idea of looking at the joy of Christian fellowship is rooted in maybe better understanding how it is that we find this connectivity. And so today we're going to talk about the tools that nurture that unity. And I suppose you could do the flip side and say the opposites of these things would be the tools that would destroy. You know, if you watch any of these renovation shows, the first thing they usually do after they've got their vision of what they want to do, they go in and they gut the house. They tear the walls down. Demolition day. But we don't want to demolish our unity. We don't want to use tools that are destructive and hurtful. We want to find those tools that nurture unity. The unity exists because the Lord puts us together. We didn't, we didn't vote on each other any more than you voted on your brothers and sisters in your earthly family. That's who came into your family. And so it is in the church, the Lord was adding to his church daily such as we're being saved. And that was the fellowship. That was the family. How do we nurture the unity of that family? Well, obviously in one lesson, we're not going to touch on every one of the tools that could be in that tool belt, but... The goal of unity is a personal responsibility. In other words, it's nice to stand up and say, well, that's what the church ought to do. That's how the congregation ought to do. Why don't we have a program for that? Ultimately, family unity is based on what the family members do. And church unity is ultimately predicated on what church members do. It's a personal responsibility. I'm going to be using for this lesson just a simple text to give us some framework for some thoughts, and it comes out of the opening verses of Ephesians chapter 4. Now, you know Ephesians 4 is a block of material. Actually, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 is a block of material for contextual study. But this is kind of the preface. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness. With patience. Bearing with one another in love. Being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, the phrase I want to begin with is this phrase, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It is incumbent on us that we put forth the individual effort that's necessary. The NIV and the Amplified translations have make every effort. Contemporary English version says try your best. New Living Version says work hard to live together as one. And Strong's uh, Biblical Dictionary would, would give the definition for the word translated being diligent to make haste, to be eager, or to zealous. My point is what, what Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus is this is a priority. This is something you need to be eager about, on fire, zealous about. Make haste. Put it up the priority list. 
every effort, try your best, work hard, being diligent. It's important for us to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Romans 12 and verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Now that's a broader context. I think that's even talking about folks that live in your neighborhood and you know, the folks who don't, you don't get along so well with, or at least don't get so long well with you. But it certainly applies within the church, doesn't it? If possible, so far as it depends on, on you, your, your role in this. Be at peace. Have unity with all these people. Well, let me suggest again the tools that I think are recorded in this text. Unity is maintained by first our determining we're going to live right and walk by the standard of godly behavior. You see, sin disrupts congregational unity. Sin, by its very definition, is a divisive spirit. If that happens to be someone coming in and teaching a doctrine that is different than what Scripture has, or, or as we've been studying out of Galatians, uh, been looking at that, other gospel, which really wasn't a gospel, that somebody came in and began preaching, what was happening? It was dividing the church. It was creating disunity. The, the energy flow was not something that was, was symphonic. It was something that was dissonant. It was something that scratched on the blackboard. False doctrine will always be a divisive issue. Because there are going to be some who are going to stand and say, truth says, the Bible says, this verse says, and then somebody else says, yeah, but you know, times have changed. Things are different. And that will create disunity. It will happen with behavior. Whenever you have a situation where an individual is misbehaving within the fellowship, it begins to create some tension, doesn't it? They're individuals who become defensive of and want to offer excuses for that behavior or will try to suggest, well, you know, it's not all that big a deal. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody sins. All of a sudden, you get some folks who become loyal to the individual or to the family of the individual. But what was the real issue? The real issue was that sin in the life of a person became a dividing factor of the people who were around them. Sin is divisive. Romans chapter 14, beginning at verse 19. So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they're evil for the person who eats and causes offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine, to do anything by which your brother or sister stumbles. Now you almost have to back up and get the picture of the context, both here and some other passages where Paul has to deal with this issue, 1 Corinthians, for instance. There was a problem in the first century with people who were converted from their Gentile background. They, they had been religious folks, okay? They, they weren't what irreligious people, but they worshipped idols, and, and they had temples, and they had sacrifices, and they had all kinds of religious trappings and things that you would go for a celebration of a feast, but the food that was served was meat that had been offered as a sacrifice. An animal offered, it was butchered, it was cooked. Some of it was sold down in the marketplace, some of it was offered at the festival, could a Christian eat that meat? Well, Paul will make clear to the Corinthians that it's meat. That's all it is, okay? If you run an analysis of the meat, it, it, it has not changed its substance simply because it has been offered at an idol, or an idol, to an idol. But it's different for the person who viewed it that way, isn't it? And so there were some Christians who even though they had the right to and they understood, it's nothing, it's just meat. There were others who saw it as meat that had been dedicated to Zeus or had been dedicated to Aphrodite or to some other idol. And so they said, how can a Christian eat that? 
while Paul says, y'all not be going down to those festivals and going to those temples, he granted the freedom to eat the meat unless, unless in doing that behavior, engaging in that activity, cause some brother to stumble and say, y'all are idolatrous. The church has become idolatrous. Drop out and lose their faith. And so this word offense is the word for a stumbling block. It was a trap that would entrap someone. And Paul says, yeah, it's, it's okay to eat that, but it's good also not to eat meat or drink, or to drink the wine, or, or to do anything by which your brother or sister stumbles. There are behaviors that can be disruptive. There are things that might be perfectly fine to engage in, But because of what they're associated with or past experiences that certain individuals may have had or fears that they have, he says, we don't want our behaviors to become divisive within the fellowship. The tool of unity is to control our action. In Luke 17, Jesus said to his disciples, it's inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It's better for him if a millstone is hung about his neck and he's thrown into the sea than that he may cause one of these little ones to sin. Life is going to have its stumbling blocks. You and I are going to face hurdles. You see those track runners going down the, uh, you know, that track with the hurdles. They used to have low hurdles and high hurdles. They've got to get over those. There's a technique they have to have to get the lead leg over, pull the back leg not they trip over them. It's inevitable we're going to have some hurdles, some challenges in our lives. He says, but woe to the person who puts them out there. Woe to the person who becomes the stumbling block by how they're living, how they're acting, or what they're demanding. And especially under this heading, sin disrupts congregational unity when that sin happens to be the sin of gossip. Proverbs 26 says, for lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no gossiper, quarreling quiets down. Like charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a contentious person to kindle strife. Well, one comment about that. We have a way of hearing things and passing them on informationally. But once we have passed along that information, we have no way of actually having evaluated its accuracy. We we trusted what we heard. The person who heard it originally trusted what they heard, but what they heard was what somebody else had trusted to be accurate. And at some point, there could be a serious breakdown. And one of the great things that can become a disruptor to unity is when people begin talking about stuff they don't really No. So if a person has a question, who are they supposed to go to? The individual with whom they may have a question. Now, it may turn out it's exactly what that was. It was accurate. But you're going to only get the information by talking to the individual. And that will quiet the crowd. It will quiet the false information. It will quiet the call to take sides. (laughs) How many times have you been in a situation where you knew a couple and you love both the husband and the wife, and they were going through a rocky spell in their marriage, maybe separated, maybe divorcing, and you were fortunate enough, you resisted the temptation to take sides. But it wasn't that there probably were some facts that needed to be addressed, but guess what? In talking to either one of them, you aren't going to get the whole story. In fact, neither one of them really understand the whole story because it's bigger than that. And so, instead of gossiping, pray. When you hear things, just silence it and pray. Ask for God's blessing of unity. Well, unity is maintained by living right, godly behavior, living as we've been called by the Lord. Second, unity is maintained by possessing a humility of heart. It's how we look at ourselves in our own mirror. Back to our text in verse 2, he said, with all humility and gentleness. 
1 Peter 5, 5, You younger men likewise be subject to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You remember the two fellows who went into the temple to pray? You had the Pharisee who was talking to God, but was actually talking to himself. Uh, how good he was, how righteous he was, how generous he was, how law-keeping he was. Then you had the tax collector beating on his chest saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. So humble he wasn't even willing to lift his eyes up to the presence of God, but he simply looked down in, in a sense at the mirror of his own soul and saw that sinfulness. God is opposed to the proud. He said only one of those two went down to their house justified, and it was the humble penitent sinner. He gives grace to the humble. So we maintain this unity of fellowship when we recognize our own humanity and our own struggle. Humility shows up, I think, at least three ways. One of those, it shows up in our willingness to be taught. Do you find it, and now you probably, you may not like teaching, okay? I'll be honest, I like teaching because I get to control what I say. I get to write my outline. I get to say it the way I want to say it. It's hard sometimes to be the student. It's hard to sit back and listen. It's hard to be challenged, confronted, in some cases exposed for the weakness and the struggle that we have. Humility shows up in our willingness to be taught. James 1.21, therefore, ridding yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, that sounds like the way we live, right? Righteous living. In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. Unity is going to be enhanced when all of us can sit and listen to the word of God as learners. When, when we are open to finding out, you know, I, I didn't know that. I, I haven't been doing that right. I... I I've been struggling with that. I need to confess that. As opposed to sitting with our self-righteous attitude as if we've got everything figured out and we know all the answers and we've been doing it right for 20 years. How dare anybody come in here and challenge? Humility allows us to listen to the Word of God. Humility allows God to be at work in our lives. And recognize that he's at work in the lives of everybody else who's a part of the family. So there's humility in the way we listen. There is also humility in the way we value other people. Here's our familiar text. Aubrey already used it today. It's over our doors. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility... Consider one another as more important than yourselves. Now, this is how we look at people. And folks, we read this, I read this passage, I believe this passage, and this passage is harder to implement than sometimes we want to admit. Consider one another as more important than yourself. Don't merely look out for your own personal there's no word here, personal need, personal interest, but also for the, of others. <laughs> their needs, their heart, they, they become more important than us. You know, as parents, when our children are born, we step back and we recognize they kind of become more important than us. I don't mean that in an inherent value before God sense, but I mean... You would sacrifice for them, wouldn't you? You would go without a meal if you only had food for one. You'd feed your kid. I know that. When it comes time for a holiday, a birthday, Christmas, you don't buy each other gifts. If you can't afford it, you buy your kids something. Why? Because they've become more important. When they're sick at night, you don't say, hey, i got to get up and go to work in the morning. Tough. Clean up your own mess. No, you stay up all night and take care of them because you've recognized their need. You brought them into the world. You're their parents. Well, that's the challenge in the family of God, is for me to honestly have the kind of humility that lowers 
I don't mean in a demeaning way. I'm not talking about lowering my self-worth. But I'm talking about elevating your self-worth. That when I look out at your needs, I treat them as more important than mine. That's the tool for humility and unity. Love must be free of hypocrisy. Detest what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Instead of getting patted on the back, we'd rather pat somebody else on the back. Doesn't mean we don't like getting patted on the back. Doesn't mean we don't like to be honored and praised and recognized. It just means that even as good as that feels, it feels even better to do that to somebody else. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's how we build unity. To be taught to value others and then to serve unselfishly. That's how humility shows up. Galatians 5, 13, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity of the flesh, but, but, serve one another through love. Serve, literally, be enslaved to, minister to one another through love. The motivation is love, the activity is service. That's, that's how humility shows itself. Instead of sitting around waiting for somebody to come do something for us, we're looking aggressively trying to find some new way that we can serve and minister to the needs of the people who are around us. Well, unity is maintained by living right, having godly behavior, having humility as we look at our own lives. But unity is also maintained by being patient with the people who are around us. Back to our text, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Now this patience, there are two different words in the Greek text that deal with the idea of patience. This is the word patience that is long fused. (laughs) Uh, Macrothubia, long tenure on your anger. It doesn't rise up real fast. There's the kind of patience where you just put up with idiosyncrasies. This has to do more with the idea of our self-control. It's how we respond to people who are around us. It's not just that we ignore and put up. It is the idea that we're in control of how we think and our attitudes with the people. We bear with one another. Maybe is almost the flip side of that patience. We have a long sense of our anger, and we have a sense that we put up with and bear up with whatever it is that's going on in other people's lives because we love them. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14, we urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. Look at this one. Be patient with every one. I didn't say it was easy to have unity, did I? I didn't say that this congregational oneness that we seek to have, you know, is a snap of the finger. It requires tools of work. And we're patient with everyone. Not everybody is mature. Some are very immature. Not everybody have an understanding. Some are still learning. And we're willing to facilitate that and And as long as folks are trying, we're willing to keep trying with them. Be patient. Why? Because God is patient. God is patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if God is patient, God's been patient with me through my ups and my downs, my frustrations, all of those things. God's still patient with me. I need to be patient with the folks in my life. And we're patient because we don't fully understand circumstances. We really don't understand what's going on in somebody's life in the, in the church. You think you do, but you really don't. You see some outward behavior. You've seen children who have acted out, and we see their behaviors, and we think, well, that's unacceptable behavior. Try to find out why they're acting out like that. There's something going on. 
they may be being abused. And there may be an adult in a congregation who's being abused. There may be an individual who all of a sudden is frightened at bankruptcy or is dealing with a relationship issue where a family member won't talk to them anymore. And yeah, maybe they act out. Maybe they, they're not as regular as they were in their attendance. May, maybe they, they seem a little curt. Maybe they don't speak in the hallway. And all of a sudden we draw some conclusion. Be patient. Because somewhere deep down inside, they're going through a very difficult time. And it's our patience that's going to help hold them in, keep them connected until some of those things are resolved. And as we talk and we discover a little bit more about the reality of their situation, we're able to minister a little bit better. We're able to pray a little more accurately. We're able to encourage a little more realistically. You don't fully understand circumstances. That's why we're patient with people is because we, we've... In our humility, we've come to understand, I don't really know what's going on. And the goal of this unity is all that important. Patience is kind of going the second mile, isn't it? Now what Jesus said? One thing, if you're compelled to go a mile by a Roman officer, it's quite something different when you choose to go a second mile. And that's what we do with one another in the family. We volunteered to go the second and the third mile with them because they are important, the family is important, the unity is important. Let me try to summarize everything that we've talked about today with one other passage. Colossians 3 is very much parallel text to Ephesians 4. He says, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a Heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so must you do also. And again, that sounds almost like that list, doesn't it? We have a calling, chosen of God, we're holy and beloved. We, we live right, and then we have humility, and we exhibit compassion and kindness and patience with others. But he adds to this story in verse 15, or verse 14. In addition to all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ, to which you were indeed called in one body, rule in your hearts and be thankful. The peace to which you and I have been called in Christ is supposed to take control of our hearts and it will change how we act toward the people who are around us. But I love the picture in verse 14, love. Put on love because it's the perfect bond of unity. We will be united when we really love each other. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13 or in your memory from your verse last year of those traits of love. You have those traits for the person sitting next to you and the person sitting back in this corner and the people who are back in the other Bible classes. You have that kind of love for them. We'll stick together. It'll see us through. It'll help us deal with whatever it is that comes to the family. Let me end with this quote. It says, if your love is the selfish love of the world, you will love your church as long as they don't fail or disappoint you. But when they do, you'll hold a grudge and complain, causing more dissension, or you'll simply leave. We must all have agape love in order to maintain that unity. Well, Lord willing, next week, we will explore lesson number nine. We'll talk about expressions of fellowship. In other words, what does it look like? And we'll get back, really get to the kind of a practical picture of what we've laid out in theory here, a family and partnership and acceptance and unity and all of those things. When we talk about fellowship, how does it actually take place? What's going on? So what does it look like? 
We'll take that up next week. Father, we ask your blessing as we leave. We pray that you keep us safe this afternoon. We pray that we'll always be working diligently to maintain the unity of the Spirit that you desire for us to have and that you'll help us keenly be people who love one another, that you'll bless us and bring us back this evening as we worship together again. In Christ's name we pray, amen.